how you as an existing property investor can increase your passive income or if you're not yet a property investor how you can ensure that your passive income increases every single year from property investing we're going to be talking about rents do you want to achieve wealth and passive income through property investing PK Gupta, host of Oz Property Investment Mastery, will help you achieve passive income by buying top 5% growth and positive cash flow property and building a portfolio using data without you wasting months of time doing research, spending weekends at inspections, or dropping $10 to $20,000 on buyer's agents each time. So if you are confused and overwhelmed by the amount of contradictory information available online and don't know where to start, then this show is for you. You know, so many people think that, you know, in the COVID period, it was so hard to get a tenant. It was so hard to maintain rents. It was so hard to be a property investor. That can't be further from the truth. I have so many properties, so do my clients, so do many other people. And if you've been doing property investing properly, you will know that the last year has been one of the best years for property investors basically ever. As long as you didn't have an apartment in inner city Melbourne, Sydney, or Brisbane, your rents more likely than not have been increasing phenomenally. Your vacancy rate has been really short. All these types of things, you know, so so many of you have this kind of fear of, oh, yeah, look, well, you know, prices are increasing. Great. Could be down to interest rates. Who knows? But what if I buy an investment property and it's too late? What if I buy one and you know, I can't get a tenant. What if the rents don't increase? How does that all work? Right? And here's the thing. If you genuinely, genuinely, genuinely want to build a portfolio, whether you're watching and you already have an investment property or whether you don't yet have one, the way you build a portfolio is by extracting equity. So your price of your house goes up, you go back to the bank, they give you, you know, a proportion of that price increase as a new deposit and you take that and you go on so so many people ask me well pk here's the thing like if you just get into that a little bit you'll notice that when your price increases and the bank gives you that next deposit that next loan we call that equity well that's not free money pk that's like that's another debt that's another loan so if we keep doing that then isn't that going to cost us more and more and more money to service those loans Yes, but only if your rents don't increase. If it takes two years for you to extract equity from one house to fund another deposit, for, to fund another house, in that one, in that two years, your rent should have gone up $20, 30 40 $50 a week so that even though you have a new loan, it's still positive cash flow. So here are eight ways in which you can ensure that your rent goes up every single year so that when you're building a portfolio, you never hit negative gearing territory. This is how you make sure you minimize your vacancy. And this is how you build passive income. So guys, if you're already a property investor, you need to listen to this. And if you're not, and you're kind of umming and ahhing about buying, you're kind of scared. I know what it feels like, right? This is hundreds of thousands of dollars. Watch this video right till the end and that will overcome your fears. You'll help really build confidence because guys, we've been buying in the last one to three years in all over Australia from places like Perth to places like Wodonga, Albury, Orange, Bendigo, uh, Melbourne, Adelaide, regional and capital cities. And as long as you follow the data, you can get, and all of my clients every single year, including me, (laughs) I'm my number one client, get passive income rises every single year. Rents go up, not by $5, but by $10, $20, et cetera. So here's how we do it, okay? I'm I'm just going to tell you. The first thing you need to really understand is that no one cares about your financial position. No one cares about your money as much as you do. Not even me, okay? You care about your money the most. So you need to be the captain of the ship. So when you have a property and it comes to, you know, maybe uh, two weeks, two months, three months before your lease is expiring with the current tenant, you need to, um, instead of waiting on the back seat, on the back foot, hoping that your property manager tells you what to do, you need to be on the front foot telling your property manager 
what to do. Okay, so in terms of how much that rent increase should be, how much or how long your rental or your lease should be、um, renewed for, all these things you shouldn't react to your property manager, but you should be proactive and work with your property manager. Okay, you're the captain of the team. I often say that property investing is like playing cricket. You know, you can't be the captain, the opening bowler, the opening batsman, the fielder at slip. Point gully coach third man, all these sorts of things. Twelfth man, sorry, you can't be everything at, at the same time. You're the captain, but you need to know how to manage those team of players around you. So that's tip number one. We'll go into more mechanical tips as well. Tip number two is to diarize. You know, the to begin the lease renewal process three months before the lease actually expires. So let's say the lease is expiring in January. I would diarize in my calendar to reach out to my property manager in October or November to really get a conversation going of how much should we increase this by, how much, you know, do the tenants really want to stay, what is their motivation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this way, you know, you can minimize your vacancy. Look, if the expiry point of the lease is going to be in two weeks, and you start the process in one week's time, you've left it so late. Like the paperwork alone takes longer than one week to really、um, transpire. So that way, you're you know increasing your vacancy, which really isn't what we want. We want to be on the front foot, diarize to think about it three months before. Um, the lease has expired, and none of this actually takes that much time. You just need to be on it. It requires a little bit of focus. Like I probably spend about ten hours a year on all my properties, and I I just did a video. My last video was about my own portfolio and how I started. So you'll know that I have around ten properties, ten hours a year. That's how much I spend. This does not take that much work, guys. All right, tip number three to increase your rent, to increase your passive income every single year. From property investing, all right. So in the majority of cases, the tenants, you know, respect the property and pay rent on time. You know, tenants are actually good people. Oftentimes, tenants think landlords are bad people, and landlords think tenants are there to trash the place. Ninety percent of human beings are, are nice people, right? So the logical decision every single time is to offer the tenant a lease renewal. All right. So work with the tenant. Don't just be Ag- arrogant or agnostic to what they say, work with them. You really want them to carry on and on and on because if they leave and you need to get a new tenant, even if the new tenant is paying ten dollars more than the previous tenant, you have to pay advertising fee to the property manager. You often need to pay、um, a new tenant acquisition fee to the property manager because it takes them time to actually, you know, onboard a new tenant. All these sorts of things. So. Your first preference is always to renew the lease, even if it's five dollars less than what you could get, let's say, by getting a new tenant in. So work with your tenant; they're your friends. Work through the property manager, but work with them. Number four: first impressions are really, really, really important. So if you are having to look for a new tenant, make sure your property manager is using good quality photos. Now, now here's a, a kind of a.、Um, A controversial point. I would argue that more than thirty to forty percent of property managers are actually not worth what we pay them. Now, I have a lot of property manager friends in the industry all over Australia. My connections, you know, what my clients use, I refer them, etc., etc. But more than thirty to forty percent of property managers don't actually know how to manage your properties. To the extent that they can be. So one thing that you need to be managing your team or managing your property manager really well on is make sure the photos of that advertising advertisement, sorry, for your property are really crisp and really good quality. Not like a a street shot that's boring that's just taken off a phone. You know, not not in a way that. In the description, it, it misses all the key points of your of your property. Like, let's say there's air conditioned rooms, or there's storage, or particularly large rooms, or built in wardrobes, or a really nice deck. You really want your property manager to list all those features and really good photos in the listing itself. What we do when we buy property is we make sure we get. 
the selling agent's property photos, which, you know, cost about $1,000. We get them for free through a particular clause in our contracts. But even if you can't do that using those legal clauses, make sure you pay for good quality photos. It will give you the return on investment that you want. Okay, number five. Here's a really, once again, maybe a controversial one. Um, you really, really, really want to make sure that you allow for pets. Now, I know a lot of you are thinking, well, pets, you know, damage my property. I'm never going to allow pets. Let me qualify that statement. As long as they are small, like let's say a small dog compared to a large dog, I am completely fine with that. And small dogs don't really, you know, cause big ruckus or damage in the house. And what you can often demand is another 10, 20, 30 dollars of rent if you're allowing um, a pet or a small dog or something like that in your rental property. I know I have a, pr- a place in Brisbane and the lady, she's, she's actually rented it for five years, amazing tenant. Uh, she's a nurse. Um, you know, she actually wanted another dog and she was saying, hey, through the property manager, she was saying, hey, Pika, I'm, I'm happy to give you another 20 bucks um, so I can have this dog. And I was like, well, why am I going to say no to her? Because she's been a really loyal actually really good tenant. I was saying, yeah, absolutely. It's a win-win for me. $20 a week, you know, that's like $1,000 a year more in my back pocket. And she gets what she wants. It's a win-win situation. So many tenants these days actually have pets. So you're alienating or truncating your demand or your potential demand if you say no to pets irrationally altogether. Okay, number six. Really make sure you understand the rental market in where you've bought your house. Don't just rely on the property manager. So oftentimes the property managers, they can, I'm not saying they are, they can be lazy, right? They can say, oh yeah, let's just put the rent up by 20 bucks. But I know for a fact, like places where we bought in Hobart, you know, four or five years ago, um, Launceston, Bernie, some property managers might say, oh, yeah, rental market's great. Let's just, you know, let's increase the rent by, you know, 10, 20 bucks. But actually, in many of these places, even as, you know, as soon as, you know, in the last few months, you know, you could actually increase your rent by $40 and not have the tenant blink an eye. And the reason they wouldn't blink an eye is because they know that in all of Hobart, there are literally 117 rental properties on the market. So they have no other options. And the fact that they can still afford it is uh, revealed through their income statements, through their pay slips. So it's not like we're putting arduous pressure on them either. It's supply demand. And so if you can understand the rental market yourself, it doesn't take long once you know how to do this, right? If you can do this yourself, then you can really play that devil's advocate against the property manager. And that way, if you play the devil's advocate against the property manager in the next year or the next six months or after two years, the property manager is more likely to give you a better quality service because they're like, yeah, this guy actually knows what he's doing. All right. Number seven, be very careful to structure your lease period so that it expires in a hot period. So what I mean by that is let's say you bought a property in March don't just go for, by default, a 12-month lease because March in that particular geography location may not actually be the tightest of conditions in the rental market, you know, cyclically in that time of year. You may want to truncate the lease to finish in January, let's say. And in January in that market, the you know, generally the rents might be higher. You know, you can have the same property market where in, in January you get, let's say, 450 a week and in April you get 400 a week. Right, so you need to make sure you structure your tenant, uh, your leases, the duration, the periods of the leases, in such a way that they expire in a really hot period where the tenant knows that they don't really have that much options out there because everything is high, and that way you can get a really good result as well. All right, um, number eight. Okay, so this is the last one that I'll be talking about. Is that it's sometimes a good idea to do some basic renovations either between when you bought the house and you're first renting it out or between tenants. So oftentimes when we buy houses, we put various legal clauses in whereby we can do, you know, very basic um, cosmetic renovations to the house even before the settlement period, you know, even while the other vendor is still owning the house. And that way, by the time it settles, when we get the key, you know, we can get the tenant moving in the next day. That's beautiful, zero vacancy. But, you know, after you've held a house for, let's say, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight years, there's going to be times when you actually need to do some cosmetic renovations. You might need to paint the house, which you can't necessarily do indoors. 
when the tenant is there because they need to leave for a number of days. Um, so you can re really use the opportunity between tenancies to give it a lick of paint, you know, to polish the floorboards, update the lighting fixtures, all these sort of things that a, a really strong strategic renovation require. Um, and in a renovation, you should always be getting, you know, two to three dollars return on investment for every dollar you put in. But this is the time to do it. And not only will you build equity that way, but you'll also increase your rent. So maybe a, a five thousand dollar renovation can get you another fifty, sixty, seventy, eighty dollars a week in rent, which pays for the renovation in one or two years' time, right? And thereafter, it's all return on investment. It's all cash. Um, so these are these are eight things that I really want you to consider. But the reason that we invest in property is to build passive income. The reason that you need to manage your team, especially your property manager, and especially increasing your rents and reducing your vacancy, is so that passive income can increase every single year, so that you can borrow against the first property again, and buy the second, borrow against the second again, buy the third, borrow against the third again by the fourth, et cetera, et cetera. So you really need that rent to be increasing. Don't just buy in a location where capital growth is occurring. Buy in a location where rents are increasing. People don't understand this. You'll only hear, hear these sorts of pieces of advice from people who actually have large portfolios. Now, there are people that have much larger portfolios than me, but take it from me. I have a fairly large portfolio you know, it's only in hindsight can you give yourself the confidence and also to give yourself the know-how that rent increase is as important as capital growth if you want to build a portfolio. Otherwise, even though you buy your first property positively geared, after pulling money out of it one or two times, it'll become negatively geared, the banks will stop lending to you, that's the finish. All right, guys, so <laughs> hopefully this is really, really useful. Um, if it was useful, tag someone who's going to actually benefit my name's PK, and I'll leave a link below on how you can learn all of this in a many, many, many more layers of detail systematically and in a structured way. But guys, try to do this yourself. If you can't, then I'll leave a link to the Property Investment Accelerator below. I hope you have a fantastic day, and here's to your passive income, not so that you can buy a Ferrari or a mansion. I don't have those things myself but just so that you can you know, reduce your hours at work, perhaps stop working in the future, spend more time with the family, really do the things that you want to and not be a slave to the industrial revolution. My name's PK, catch you later, bye.